Will you please join me in the prayer for illumination? O oh God, our guide, set your path clearly before us and lead us to follow you willingly. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from Psalm 68. Let God rise up. Let his enemies scatter. Let those who hate him run scared before him. Like smoke is driven away, drive them away. Like wax melting before fire, let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be glad and celebrate before God. Let them rejoice with gladness. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Exalt the one who rides the clouds. The Lord is his name. Celebrate before him. Father of orphans and defender of widows, in God is God in his holy habitation. God settles the lonely in their homes. He sets prisoners free with happiness. But the rebellious dwell in a parched land. When you went forth before your people, God, when you marched through the wasteland, Selah, the earth shook. Yes, heaven poured down before God, the one from Sinai before God, the God of Israel. You showered down abundant rain, God. When your inheritance grew weary, you restored it yourself, and your creatures settled in it. In your goodness, God, you provided for the poor. My Lord gives the command. Many messengers are bringing good news. The kings of armies are on the run. The kings of armies are on the run. The women back home divide the spoil. Even if you lie down among the sheepfolds, there are wings of a dove covered with silver, its pinions covered in precious gold. When the Almighty scattered the kings there, snow fell on Mount Zalman, mighty mountain, Mount Bashan, many peaked mountain, Mount Bashan. You many peaked mountain, why do you look with envy at the mountain God desired for his dwelling, the mountain where the Lord dwells forever? God's chariots are twice 10,000, countless thousands. My Lord came from Sinai into the sanctuary. You ascended the heights, leading away your captives, receiving tribute from people, even from those who rebel against the Lord God's dwelling there. Bless the Lord, the God of our salvation, supports us in day after day. A reading from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 4 through 13. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this week we are wrapping up this short three-week worship series as we explore these phrases, these half-truths that get passed around often by Christian people. There are these cliche phrases that we say. Sometimes we don't like to admit that we say them. But we say them when we don't know what else to say, right? So this week... We're talking about this saying. I bet you can finish it even without, if you haven't looked at your bulletin. I bet you can finish it. God, God helps those who? Help themselves. Yes, help themselves. It's a popular one, isn't it? God helps those who help themselves. I learned uh, this week that this phrase is so, uh, so much a part of the common Christian ethos, the kind of folk theology in America, that when the Barna Group took a poll and asked people what are the wi- most widely known Bible verses, this phrase was near the top. So then take it even further. This is trivia for the confirmation class. 75% of American teenagers believe that this is the central message of the Bible. Right, the first part was funny. That's haunting. 75% of American teenagers believe that the central message of the Bible is that God helps those who help themselves. Friends, nowhere in the Bible does it actually say God helps those who help themselves. It's not in there. The saying became popular when Benjamin Franklin uh, threw it into the, the 1736 edition of Poor Richard's Almanac. And some other people were saying similar things before that, but there's just not a saying like that in the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no truth in it, right? So here's what we do find in Scripture. First, what we find in Genesis when God made Adam and Eve and placed them into the garden God gave them work to do, right? God gave them responsibility. God shared power with them. And from the get-go, God set up this partnership with humanity. Not an equal partnership, exactly, but definitely one in which God expects us to work alongside God's work. And that's both in our lives and in the world. So God has arranged the world in such a way that God doesn't do everything. God shares God's own work with us. I believe that God really does expect us to help. At a couple of points in the Apostle Paul's letters, Paul gets more than a little irritated with folks who are being lazy. You see, when Paul began these churches, he really believed that uh, this whole... Christ will come again idea that we say. He thought it was imminent. He believed that Jesus was going to return and it was going to be soon. And some of the folks heard that and they thought, hey, you know, if Jesus is coming back so soon, then I'm just going to quit my job and hang out, you know, let things go from there. I'm going to enjoy these last few days and not do anything. And so they did. They got lazy and they thought that Jesus was around the corner waiting to come and, the, and make this whole heaven on earth thing happen. And then in the meantime, they started, because it dragged on a little longer than they expected, they started mooching off of their neighbors and to uh, the other people in the church. And so Paul writes to them and he says, listen, anyone who doesn't work doesn't get to eat. He warns them, he, he warns them against... Um, Staying away from those people who are living in idleness. In other parts of scripture, especially we find in the book of Proverbs, we find this focus on avoiding laziness and um, this expectation that loving God goes hand in hand with working and doing and providing and helping. It's part of how we love God. So think about it this way. God made us in such a way that we can usually, most of us can usually get what we need. God didn't position us as 
receivers who have no control over what comes our way. My mom told me about this time when she went on a trip with the youth group, and those of you who have ever been on a a trip with a youth group know that the one thing that makes it an official youth group trip is that the van has to break down, right? (laughs) It's daunting for me to say that because next weekend I won't be here. I'll be leading the youth trip, (laughs) but we're only going to be an hour away, so hopefully that will work out okay. Um, So we had taken this youth trip, and I was one of the youth, and of course the van broke down. And there was this discussion among the adults who were on the trip about what to do, how to handle this broken down van. This, children, was before the days of cell phones. I know, it's really hard to believe, but uh, there was no way to contact anyone from the side of the road. It really, it's hard to imagine for me. (laughs) Uh, So there was this discussion, and there was one woman who just kept saying, I really think that we just need to stop and to pray. I think that prayer is really the thing that we need here. God, God will take care of us. We just need to ask. And my mom, being my mom, said back to this lady, okay, well, you go pray, and I'm going to walk to the next town and call the mechanic, and we'll just see if God can work with that. And sure enough, God worked miracles. <laughs> Does God help those who help themselves? Well, yeah. God works in partnership with us. And when we have something to offer in that partnership, I, I think we better well offer it. I think God expects it of us. We work and we offer our part. And then we pray for God to offer God's part too. We work and we pray and we pray and we work. These things go hand in hand. We can trust God, and we can also lock our doors at night. You can pray for God to help you find a job, and then you can also send out a hundred resumes. Sending out the resumes doesn't mean that you don't trust God to provide the job. It just means that you're opening up a hundred different ways for God to do that. Knowing all the while that God may do something that you haven't even thought of yet. So the half-truth really is half-true. God really did give us the means, the talents, and the abilities, the tools to provide for ourselves. Thousands of years ago, man had the ability, and women too, the ability to hunt animals and to grow grain and to gather berries and all other kinds of food. But they had to actually do something in order to eat, right? They really did have to help themselves. But then there's this one time in Scripture when God's people were stuck out in the wilderness. And although they had the ability to hunt and to grow things and gather food, there just there was no food to be found. And they wondered if they would have been better off back in Egypt where they had just escaped from generations of slavery. At least there they had food, right? Out here in the desert, they were bound to starve to death. They literally could not help themselves. But then God made food happen. God rained down this white, flaky stuff, just just enough each day. And they couldn't gather up a few days' worth and keep it in the pantry, you know, to be industrious and self-sufficient. Because if they did, it would just rot. Instead, they had to come back day after day after day to remember who the food came from. They had to live in this fragile balance of life and see that God really did give them what they could not find or make for themselves. The truth is, sometimes, as much as we hate it and as much as we hate to admit it, sometimes we are absolutely powerless to help ourselves. If you've ever spent time in a hospital bed, then you know that feeling when you can do nothing to help yourself. Sometimes we just need God's help. Sometimes the way that God helps those who can't help themselves is, like I told the children, through the help of other people. Every day here you have the opportunity to be that very help that God longs to give to someone else. You have the opportunity to look to the interests of others, as Paul says. 
If you've ever been a part of a mission trip or an ASP trip and gone to spend a few days repairing someone's home, fixing their, um, their roof or helping to build a church or a school, you've probably heard someone say, we've been praying that God would help us and now you're here. God sent you as an answer to our prayers. Sometimes you may be the very help that God longs to give to someone. We call that being the hands and the feet of Christ. It's about waking up in the morning and saying, God, who do you want me to bless today? And then keeping your own eyes open for who it is that God is using to bless you to. Those that God is using to help you. But then sometimes God helps those who cannot help themselves in ways that are a lot harder to explain. Sometimes God works in our lives through the Holy Spirit in such a way that we say nobody but God could have done that. When a a marriage is healed after a break in trust and two people are able to rebuild their covenant together, or when an addiction is overcome against every odd, when a, a way seems to be made where there was just no way before. Sometimes, with God's help, you, you can't see how God did it, but the evidence is there that God changes our lives. Is it true? Does God help those who help themselves? Well, yeah, kind of. But even with a kernel of truth in it, I ask, is that the most important thing for us to know about God? No. 75% of teenagers believe that this is the central message of the Bible. I would much, much rather 75% or 100% of teenagers knew with assurance that there is a God who created them just as they are and loves them so deeply that God was willing to die their death so that they might live God's life. Friends, there's no getting around it. If you believe that this is the central message of the Bible, then you simply haven't read the Bible. If you believe that God is in the business of helping people in the same measure that they are able to help themselves, then you and I know a different God. I know the God that we read of in the psalm, who is the father of orphans and the defender of widows, who gives sight to the blind and sets prisoners free, who, as Mary sang, lifts up the lowly and fills the hungry with good things. The God that the psalmist sang about when he said, I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is the God that Paul talks about when he says, you see, at just the right time, When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. This is the God who made God's very life a gift, looking not to his own interests, but to the interests of others, not to help himself, but to help others, to humble himself and be obedient to death, even death on a cross, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. I believe that it is God's character, God's very joy, to help those who cannot or do not help themselves. Friends, it's called grace. And it is available for you and for me, free of charge. You can't earn it, you can't buy it, because you don't need to. God gives it away in measures that are more enough, more than enough. For you to share it with all the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.